with uh, Brit and Dandies uh, for 30 years, who is Brit specialist, who is amazing groomer and handler and breeder and just an amazing person. So Emma, thank you for joining me for this interview and um, let's make this positive talk about Dandies. Thank you very much. That's very sweet of you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, very happy to be here and to share whatever knowledge I've I've gathered over my 30 years. And um, hopefully it will be helpful to people coming in the future. Yes, me too. And uh, I hope that uh, in future some judges will join us uh, to listen about dandies to uh, learn what uh, they have to pay attention at uh, shows judging dandies and uh, maybe we will be uh, useful for someone. So, Emma, tell us please, how did you come into dandies and how you got interested in uh, this breed? Well, um, I, I was in my early 20s and I was showing... Uh, miniature schnauzers. Oh. I had actually always wanted a dandy dinner uh, since I saw a picture of one in a book, but I didn't know how to get hold of one. Um, and after I had been in miniature schnauzers for about six years, I decided that my heart really was with dandy dinner. I think it was something about their face. And they they looked like wise old men. And um, so I looked for a breeder in Australia. There was one breeder who was just going out of the breed. And there were some people who were had a couple of dogs that they brought from New Zealand and had a litter. And I was able to get a puppy from them. And I then took myself to the UK, having studied the breed standard very carefully. And I went and sat and at a show at Birmingham and watched a morning of Dandy Din Monteria judging. And I picked the bitch that I liked best, that to me looked most like the breed standard. It was not a bitch who won that day. I think she might have been reserve CC. She didn't win the breed. But to me, she was everything I felt, having read and studied the standard, that they should be. So I went and visited the, the lady who had her, who was Mrs. Weatherstone, which was Borderstone Dandy Dinmonts. And I said to her, you know, I was looking for a foundation bitch and I loved her bitch and I wanted to get a bitch out of her bitch. And I didn't care who she bred it to, but I felt that it was important to start with, um, with a bitch that came out of a really quality bitch. And I was very fortunate that she then bred that particular bitch to an American import. She had a litter of three puppies, two males and a female, and she very, very generously sent me the bitch. Amazing. And that was my foundation bitch. And every dandy in my kennel to this day descends from her. Um, she was very, very special. Borderstone Dawn Dancer. And she was a All Breeds Best in Show winner 12 weeks after having a cesarean when she had her second litter of puppies. So she was an amazing, amazing, wonderful dog. So that pretty much cemented my love of the breed. There was no going back after that. So that's how I came to be in Dandies. Yeah, it's so amazing, you know. I have I ever told you how I came into Dennis? No. When I was twelve, uh, it was a school notebook with the uh, breeds of dogs, and somehow in Ukraine uh, there was printed on the notebook Dandy Din Montreal of very poor quality, as now yes. I understand. Yes, nice, very poor quality. <laughs> but, but I, I felt like 
it was pepper dandy and it became my dream i came to my parents and said okay you have your german shepherds i need this dog please and they said forget <laughs> and i was like wow because my mom used to have poodles also as well and i was like i want this dog and they, where is it from uk no 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 we will not go to uk forget and when i was 18 i took my mom's female german shepherd went myself uh, for a meeting with her to crimea it's uh, around 500 kilometers between uh, our cities so i uh, traveled by train between my uh, examinations in the university uh, i got that female mated came back home next day i uh, made my exam in philosophy and after two months i got puppies which i sold like for example i don't know exactly now the highest price for german shepherd in ukraine was the time something like 400 usd and it was my cheapest price for the puppy because i wanted dandy dean monterrier <laughs> And I sold all the puppies, only left one for me. And uh, thanks to judge from Czech Republic for who, um, with whom I worked as a steward at dog show. He helped, he contacted few breeders and uh, they agreed to sell me male. <laughs> so my first Indy was male, but I was pretty happy with him. It It is the best dog ever. For sure, the sweetest character and temper. My first my male dandy that I bought in in Australia was <clears throat> such a different temperament to anything I'd ever encountered. He was so stubborn and serious, but at the same time, he was he had a sense of humor that I think that's a quality in the dandy that I really noticed after coming from miniature schnauzers that can be very serious and um, argumentative. Dandies are very sweet-natured and easygoing and they have a sense of humour. I think that yes, was part that's of true. Most of them have and a lot of dandy smiles and it makes me just so happy when I see their smile. Uh, what qualities or characteristics do you believe make dandies uh, a unique and special breed? I always describe to people, you know, that are new to dandies and particularly trainee terrier judges that we have doing their, their study for their <laughs> judging license, that dandies in many ways are not like your average terrier. They're not like the average terrier in temperament. I would say they're much more like a hound. They're much more laid back, stubborn, independent, easygoing, and they're not always looking for a fight. So they're not like a fox terrier or a, some of the, the, the terriers that you spar in the ring and get them all fired up. And I think it's that quality that, attracted me to them is that they're not not a typical terrier and when you look at their breed standard they're almost everything that the generic terrier isn't they're curvy they have big eyes they have round eyes they have a curvy top line um, there's a lot about them that is unique among the terriers and much more like a hound, a scent hound, I would say. And I think, you know, the heritage probably has some scent hound in it just by their, their, their character. Um, that's what I would say is, is unique to them. And, yeah. And their coat, their coat is totally different to many of the terriers in that it's, a combination of crisp hair, not wiry hair, and linty hair. So, um, you know, the Bedlington has the linty coat. You can see the, the shared heritage of the two breeds because were you to hand strip a Bedlington Terrier, I suspect you'd end up with a coat that's very much like a Dandy Dinmont's coat. And were you, if you clip a Dandy Dinmont, their coat becomes much more like a Bedlington coat in texture. 
You talk uh, about hounds, and uh, you know that why I had uh, dax hounds, they are having dandies in them. And it's amazing. Supposedly so, supposedly so. And I did, I do know a wire haired dachshund breeder who said every so often they will get a dandy in the litter that has the broader head, the rounder eyes, and yeah. more top knot. So I'm sure there is some heritage. And, you know, the, the dandy was apparently owned by gypsies, and gypsies were. Um, moved around so one would expect that they took their dogs with them and there'll be a lot of shared heritage I think um, yeah they they are amazing and you know I remember once we were talking with you you told me that uh, this appearance of dandy is uh, making people to think they are teddy bears and uh, I want you to repeat this uh, uh, your phrase ah. about uh, uh, how you should uh, treat dandy for newcomers in the breed because you know a lot of people really treat them like uh, teddy bears yes and it's a very dangerous thing to do because they are a dog with a big personality who will run your life and could be a handful if not brought up properly um, and I, what I always say to puppy owners that are picking up their puppies is I say I know this puppy looks like a teddy bear but if you treat this puppy like a teddy bear it will turn into a monster but if you treat this puppy like a dog and give it rules and boundaries and routine you will end up with a teddy bear yes that's true because they can be so unpredictable if they appear in uh, wrong uh, uh, behavior rules I have yep. seen that. I have seen that have many seen times. That they can they can become a very difficult dog to manage because they have big egos and they are very clever and they're often more clever than the people that own them and they work out how to get what they want any which way. So you, I always say be very firm with a young dandy and you will end up with a wonderful, affectionate, trustworthy dog. It's um, it's very important. Today we have dandy talks with uh, Emma Greenway, Doctor Emma Greenway, who is uh, breeding dandies for. I think there are some dogs that are particularly smart. I've uh, I've had a few that learned learned how to be show dogs so quickly, um, and over the years I have developed a technique for for training my show dogs, which is all about fun and and um, games and the games are all broken it's all broken down into little lessons so that they can learn a little by little what's what's required of them in the show ring and I think it's it's one of the things I I on my travels have found a bit depressing in the past although I think it's definitely improved is so Many times people are down on their knees holding their dandies in place rather than trying to build a relationship with the dandy where the dandy knows what you want from it in the show ring and that it's you and, and your dandy together as a team being happy together. Because as a judge, there is nothing more beautiful than seeing that in the ring, this connection between dog and handler. Um, I, uh, my next question should be about uh, temperament and personality, but you already opened this topic and maybe you have something to uh, add to this uh, because no. I, we can talk yeah. about it nonstop. Uh, well, I look, at, I think temperament and personality, we, well, we've spoken a little bit about it already. To me, the thing, I mean, there's a difference, there's a difference between breeding and showing. So the temperament you're looking for in the show ring may not be the temperament you find in everything you breed from. And I know myself that I have over the years found 
some of my best bitches in the show ring aren't necessarily my best breeding stock. It might well be their sister that is the better breeder, even though they are the better show dog. And I think I would almost say that breeding and showing are two different sports. They require different thought processes because for the show ring, you're looking for the dog that enjoys showing for starters. For sure. um, and your grooming is all designed to enhance your dog to make it look its absolute best. Where and while breeding is about breeding something with good confirmation and good temperament, good temperament and a good show dog aren't the same thing always. You know, I've had bitches that I look at and I go, oh my God, you are so pretty. And you take them to the show ring and they go, oh, I don't like this. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I and know. Yet, beautiful. And then you'll get another one that that loves the show ring and is beautiful. And that's the dog you show. But the one that's beautiful but doesn't like the show ring, as long as they don't bite people or they're not timid and scared and have temperament issues, that's the dog you should be thinking about breeding, in my view. That the two don't always line up. You know, for me, I have a little bit same thoughts because uh, uh, a lot of people, especially new people who are coming into any any dog breed, I'm not talking about only uh, dandy people because um, when I used to handle dogs uh, at dog shows, I, I faced it a lot. Uh, people mating no dogs, not bloods, they are making pairs from the titles dogs having. And for me, uh, titles of the dog are not same to the quality, are not equal to the quality of the dog. Because yeah. I don't know how is it going in Australia, but uh, um, when I got a good face in handling dogs, uh, now not because I was out for some years, uh, it was so easy for me to make an international champion for a dog which has four legs. It was just a schedule of shows with I the think, right judges. Yeah. That's it. I think, I think every system has its flaws um, in terms of how dogs get titles. And in America, you can build a major, go to the show with enough dandies that aren't groomed and you're going to win with the one that does groom. In Australia, you can go to enough shows and you'll make up a basic champion. But to do a, we have titles called grand champion and supreme champions. To get those titles, you do actually have to win outside your breed. So against other dogs but I think ultimately the dog show, for, I don't show a great deal these days <clears throat> and for me dog showing is it's an occasion to go out and enjoy being with my dog looking beautiful and enjoying the connection I have with that dog because I've trained it for the show ring um most of the time I am not showing to people who are breed specialists who know intimately the breed standard and the finer points of the breed. So while it's lovely to win, at the end of the day, it's my own opinion of my dogs that ultimately matters to me. Um, and, and the occasions where I have the chance to enjoy the company of someone who's also a breed specialist and talk about the dogs because all all dogs no matter how big a winner they are um, have faults they have things that in a perfect world you'd change and I think you're kidding yourself as a breeder if you don't 
look at your dogs critically um, and you can't afford to be kennel blind if you're going to improve and go forward with your breeding program. I've been lucky enough to have bred many champions now, well over 60 or 70 in many different countries. Mm. And they all had things I loved about them and they all had things I would have changed. And hopefully um, I have moved forward and each time things get a little better with what I'm producing. But, you know, breeding is is not a straightforward thing. If it was, everyone would be breeding amazing dogs. And we know that there's a variety of qualities out there, not just in dandies, but in in all breeds. And for me personally, I've sometimes had to outcross and take a step back in the quality I'm producing in order to go forward. And I think when you look at kennels around the world, you can see people, it happens to everyone. You know, you have a, a spell where you're producing fabulous, you, you're just so happy. And then you might have a two or three litters where you've done something a little different because you needed to, to go forward. And they've, the quality's not being quite what you've been after but the important thing is not to throw that out completely because you, you know, we're talking about a breed where every dandy alive today descends from two male dogs in the 19th century. So we, even when we're outcrossing, we're not really outcrossing. And I think with breeding, it comes down to what you select ultimately in your litter where, and some people are very good at picking the puppy they want that they think is the best and other people perhaps are not so good or or they they value different things i mean i think as i was talking to you about before there's a place for everybody in the breed we need everybody and we need everybody's thoughts and opinions because we don't have the luxury of editing absolutely everything with a fault out of our out of our breed. Otherwise we'll have nothing left to breed from. It's, and I think that's something we have to always be mindful of um, when we're making decisions that when this breed was first developing in the 19th century, there wasn't a closed pedigree book. There wasn't a closed stud book where you know, we only bred to other dandies. In the early, early days, somebody would breed to something else that looked like a dandy but wasn't a dandy to, to develop the breed. That helped maintain the genetic health, that helped revitalize the genes. And now we have this closed stud book and we've had it for 100 years. We have challenges that we have to approach we have to think about when we're breeding. That means sometimes you you have to go backwards to go forwards. Yes, and it's not about breeding, it's about life. Sometimes you need to make a few steps back to get power to go forward. And that's, that's true. And it's, uh, it's very wise opinion. It, and maybe you are the first breeder I have heard about it that because you know, um, it's actually about life, not about dog breeding. And people don't mm -hmm. like to talk about their failures, you know, or about their moving back. They prefer to talk only about success. And it's human nature. It's nothing wrong in that. Yeah. And uh, I'm really now thankful to you for this opinion and uh, for talking honestly about it, that sometimes we need to go back to get uh, the progress in future. And That's if we started talking about breeding, uh, I would like to ask you uh, how you evaluate a litter and uh, who was your mentors in the beginning? 
aware, aware. I'm sorry, my English is not that perfect. That's but... quite right. I, 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 I know what you're asking. I, I was when I first came to the breed, I set out to find people who I had been in the breed a long time, who I respected what they had contributed in terms of the dogs I'd seen that they had produced and that I thought were clever groomers and had knowledge. And I saved up my money and I went to the UK and I spoke to breeders in the UK. I went to Canada and I spoke to Mike Macbeth, who was mm -hmm. uh, at that time the sort of primary breeder in Canada and had bred some very lovely dogs. I went to the US and stayed um, a few days with Kathy Nelson of Pennywise. And later on, I also um, spent spent time with, with a very long time and dear mentor of mine, Betty Ann Stenmark. Kings Mountain dandies. And those people all have contributed an enormous amount to the knowledge that I have today. And I owe them a great deal for their generosity in sharing what, what their thoughts and beliefs and ideas were, their grooming techniques. Now, I picked and choose chose from what people showed me and developed my own style. And uh, we had, with all those people, we had very healthy discussions, not necessarily disagreements, but discussions about the finer points of the breed standard. And I would encourage anyone coming to the breed, no matter whether they've come from another breed or they're brand new to dog showing and dog breeding and, and, and the world of dogs, to seek out people that they respect and ask questions because there's no such thing as a silly question. And it's only through asking questions that you learn and you have a chance to learn. And I'm very grateful to the people who who were generous enough to me in, in, in the past and to this day. And I've also had mentors outside the breed, people who I've thought were extraordinary handlers or trainers or groomers or had a, a unique and interesting thought process for looking at breed standards. One of those people is um, an Airedale breeder here in Australia called Anne Sorrigan, Old Iron Airedales. Um, I think she's quite well known worldwide and a very clever groomer, a very clever handler. And um, from her, I learned a great deal. And I, 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 I always feel very sad for people coming into the breed where and I, I've seen it in other breeds, not so much in dandies because there's really not many in, in Australia, but where people come into the breed and nobody helps them, no, and nor do they ask for help. They decide they know without asking. Um, and I, I think there's a danger in that, that you, you miss out on really learning about your breed. Yes, because people mostly behaving like competitors. They are not thinking that together they can make something good for the breed if they connect to each other, ask questions, learn from each other. They can make better work, and uh, in in the final, they can get more interesting rings. Because when you are winning, like best of breed from the best dogs. It's one feeling. And when you're coming for the show and realizing, okay, my dog is anyway better, these winnings are not so memorable, I think. It's just a normal I'm winning. very grateful. 
I am very grateful for the fact that my very first dog, which was a miniature schnauzer, was terrible. She should have been in a pet home. She was truly terrible. But I, and I don't think I won a single ribbon with her, but I learned an enormous amount. I learned about grooming. I learned about losing. And I learned what a not very good dog looks like. Because actually, it's so much harder to learn if the first dog you buy is beautiful because yes. you don't actually have to think about the breed standard, about your grooming, because you're winning anyway. So it's the downside of dog showing that we put so much emphasis on winning when it's it's more, for me, it's not so much about winning. It's about the challenge of producing the show dog you take to the show, breeding it, grooming it, training it. And growing so it. it. Because when you yeah. get a puppy, you have a chance to make it looking horrible in the end. Even if you take a very promising, like not promising, let's tell without disqualifying fault or without some uh, faults that will uh, prevent weaning. Yes, but it, it just a puppy, but you can grow it. In as, as one of my mentors said to me, if you feed your puppy, if you have two dogs in the ring together, and one dog has been groomed 2% better than the others, trained 2% better than the other, fed 2% better than the other, prepared 2% better than the other, you're already 8% ahead of the other dog, even if they're exactly the same quality. Because yes. you've done the extra work. That's true. Okay. Yeah. It, it's so interesting to listen to you and uh, you're encouraging me to make something more and to think more about what I'm doing because, uh, you know, sometimes people are lazy uh, and it's okay because in Ukraine, I, I had to make extra work only for big shows. Because judges don't know dandies, not often I was winning something in best in show, so it could be like, okay, normal grooming, and uh, now I'm at show, and when my friends from Ukraine saw me uh, making grooming and show, they were like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You were no, never doing this at, at home, and I was like, okay, I have a competition here. Uh, I'm not in Ukraine anymore. People here know what is dandy. And I have to stop being lazy about it. I have you to see, learn and see. to do my best. In Australia, I'm on, the only person showing dandies. My competition isn't in the breed. My competition is when I get to the group ring. And if I'm going to be competitive in the group, my dogs have to be trained and prepared so that they truly are competitive against the other very beautifully trained and groomed terriers that you see out there. And I know in Europe there's a much greater emphasis on winning your breed than winning at the group level, whereas in Australia it's much more about winning beyond your breed and winning the group and winning in show awards. So I think that is a good motivator. But to talk about grooming, because I think grooming is actually, it's one of the things that holds dandies back in the ring. And I mean that in two senses of the word. And the first way it holds them back is that when new people come to the breed, it's really hard to learn how to groom them well and to be competitive. So what happens is people lose heart and they give up and we lose people to the breed because it's too hard to win because the grooming is difficult. I think that's one, one side of the grooming issue. But the other side of the grooming issue that I find is that I look at some of the grooming I see 
everywhere. And, and I ask it of myself some, often. And that is that sometimes I think the grooming doesn't correspond with how we want the dandies to look according to the breed standard. Because to me, the breed standard is the blueprint that we should all be reading and thinking about when we prepare our dogs. For example, for me, I, I read the breed standard pretty regularly and think about it and modify things as I think about it. One of the things that um, I just don't understand that I see a lot of is these big white fluffy skirts on the underneath of dandies. And you see them all over the world. Um, I've I've put them on my own dogs in on occasion. You know, I've left all this fluff on. And often you'll see the the line where the the skirt meets the um, meets the body hair is straight on some dogs. And I find myself reading the breed standard and saying, why would you have a straight line for a skirt on a dog that should be all curves? Why? And what happens when you do that is you make the dog look like it's got less body and a lot of hair underneath, when in fact, this is a breed where the breed standard talks about a sprung rib, deep chest, um, you know, it's a slung front. Why do you have all that hair underneath? Apart from anything, that hair underneath, there is nothing in the breed standard that talks about a skirt, for starters. And when you have all that hair underneath, you're going to make your dog look shorter than it really is when we have a breed standard that says they should be long. So there's there's a lot of things about how people groom where I think we all just follow each other and we do what everybody else is doing and a dog wins and it's got lots of fluff so everybody leaves more hair on. And I think the benefit of me being in Australia all on my own is that I haven't had anyone to follow. And so I have to look at the breed standard and think about it when I'm grooming my dogs. And as a judge, I have to think about the breed standard when I look at the dogs in front of me in the ring. And I think, you know, lots of hair is very glamorous. I'm the first to say, you know, it. I, I, there are there's a time and a place for lots of hair, but I think sometimes the hair we leave isn't necessarily making our dogs look the best they could look. You know, and that's I, just one example. That's just one example. Is the the skirt? I was thinking about it also because it's uh, so grooming differs a lot from region to region, from country to country. Uh, and I think, yes, it's uh, one, one is uh, that people follow each other. And the other thing is uh, even, even if people read standard, and uh, I can tell you honestly that I'm uh, meeting it a lot that uh, people breed dogs without reading standard, without knowing the standard. And it's not about only dandies. It's it's about all breeds. People go to the show and tell them why my dog lost. And they even don't know the standard of their breed. Yeah. And I it, think it makes me mad sometimes. I think, I think when you start in dogs, it's easy to be caught up with the winning of the ribbons and not with the the breeding of the dogs and it's it's the responsibility of people who've been in the breed a long time i think to encourage and and assist without judgment new people because it's very easy for new people to be put off and one of my biggest concerns 
for this breed is how few young people there are coming into the breed around the world. And I would say that of many breeds, actually, of the dog world in general, that it's an aging population of people who are involved. And unless we are generous with our help, then I fear for the future of the breed, you know, because you you have to have people, young people coming coming along that have many, many years to accumulate the knowledge and the wisdom to, to really make a difference for the breed going forward. That's true. And uh, the other part, as you told, some peoples are giving up because of the grooming. And uh, mm. some of them who don't want to learn or who think it, it will be hard to learn because it's really very less information you can find uh, about dandies on the internet, despite of the fact we are living in this technologist age. Uh, but it's really, when you start looking something about dandies, you will just find some uh, general phrases about it and uh, like uh, no, no nothing uh, that will help you a lot so and when people come to the breeders most of the breeders i'm not talk about everyone uh, these people like or busy at the show or busy with something else and they are not too much friendly to the newcomers so people are just getting their pets and not going forward, even if they would like to do it. Yeah. It's it's very difficult, I think, because dog shows are not the best place for people to learn things because it is a competition and people who are there getting their dogs ready don't have the time or the, or the inclination to share their knowledge. And in a way... It's a great pity we don't have form of sort of forums that are not competitive, where people can just share their ideas, you know, um, because one person's idea of grooming and another person's idea of grooming will be different from each other, uh, or they'll have a different priority or a different value, and that conversation can help refine your knowledge. Um, you know, my my first mentor, which was Wendy Weatherstone, she she groomed very differently to me. She she broke the hair with her fingers and she only hand pulled. But we had very lively conversations about grooming, and I learned things from her, and she learned things from me. And one of the things that I think I'm most grateful to her was she hated a scissored tail. She said, Emma, a dandy should look natural. It should look just tidied up. It shouldn't be over trimmed. Now, I probably trim a little bit more than she would have liked. But I totally took on board what she said about the scimitar tail and the feather not being scissored and she showed me how to beautifully hand pull it so it looks natural and short and the right shape and just like it's grown like that and it's never got longer and I always think you know grooming should always look as natural as possible so you don't want sharp lines you don't want a face that's a chrysanthemum-y, westy head. Because when you read the breed standard, it's a top knot that's not confined to a mere top knot. There's actually nothing about the beard in the breed standard. It talks about the top of the nose, but there's nothing about the beard. So you, you, you want to make sure that the top knot is a top knot and whatever whiskers are there are whiskers. They're, it's not a round. And that was something I, you know, learned from conversations with other breeders and just came away and thought about and modified. And I'm, I'm very grateful to have had those conversations. And I think that's where we're kind of lacking um, forums for those sort of discussions. And, you know, I don't want to be 
giving this talk saying that what I think is the only way or the correct way, I can only say that this, this, this is my thinking and why I think what I'm thinking and I can explain it. I can explain it according to the breed standard and someone else doesn't have to agree with me. But I, I think we should all be able, when we look at our grooming, to be able to explain our understanding of our breed standard and why we're grooming the way we groom. And I think that's key to us really understanding what we're looking at, getting back to your other question about evaluating litters. It's through engaging with the breed standard, thinking about it, thinking about how you present your dog to look as close to the breed standard as possible, that you really get to know it. So that when you look at your litter of puppies, you know what you're looking for. Because I, I've been places where people get completely enamored with looking at the head and they don't look at much else. And then you'll get, you'll get people who'll sort of pick a puppy on at, at seven weeks old and, and decide that's the puppy I'm keeping. And in my view, I don't think you can really assess a puppy till it's about 10 weeks old because they take, they're so uncoordinated. You can't really see their movement. You can't really see how they're holding their tail until they're more coordinated, which is at about 10, 10 to 12 weeks where you start to get a sense of how they're put together and how they move and you can you you've also had time to just sit and watch them interacting with each other seeing how they respond to new experiences or new objects you you know you can see which puppy takes longer to be brave and go up to the new strange thing you've put in the garden because that tells you about that puppy's confidence it's its ability to cope with new experiences so I think evaluating a litter is, is about combining all that knowledge of the breed standard, which you get, I think, from engaging in the process of grooming as much as anything, and then looking at your puppies running around, not just stood on a table. That's true, but... Uh... Uh, you know, it's interesting uh, point of view, but, uh, but what I got in my experience, and uh, there are a lot of people with me same, you're telling that people somehow choosing puppies at seven weeks. First of all, you see uh, uh, puppy, how it would be looking in future just a few days after birth. And I saw it many times that puppies are looking same as they were born. You can see the best puppy just from the beginning. I have never been able to do that. So I'm a failure when it comes to that. Maybe maybe I got it from my dad because he was like, so he was. I have heard it said, I've heard it said, but for me, I, I have never, I've never stuck with the puppy I've looked at newly born and gone, this is the one, very, I can't think of a time when that's been true of the of the bigger puppy. <laughs> but time when you have to look at them, it's right seven, eight weeks because they're generally parent. If you don't do something wrong to your puppy, it will be exactly the same as a grown-up dog because some puppies are growing like ugly dogs and they are changing. And that's oh, I, I, I definitely agree, but I think... When I bred miniature schnauzers, I think eight weeks was about the right age. But I think with dandies, it's a little bit older for me. Maybe it's my what I'm used to seeing in my 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 litters. But for me, I, I'm more confident that I'm making the right choice. And usually at 10 weeks, I will eliminate the ones that I know are pets for whatever reason. And then I usually will hang on to the better ones even for another six six weeks while I watch them grow. It's interesting. I have to try this way also. 
because like uh, I'm already on this way because I still don't have puppy that I'm chosen <laughs> I've chosen for myself. <laughs> it's first time it's in my life. One of the things that I've noticed over the years is whenever I bring in a new bloodline, I get very different looking puppies, which I have to really take time to think about because they develop differently. And quite often they have slightly different temperaments to what I'm used to. And then um, it, it, it becomes much more difficult. And I, I actually think the whole kind of outcrossing all the time makes it extremely difficult to select puppies because you're always working somewhat in the dark. So my, my breeding program has been one that's predominantly line breeding. So I'm breeding relatives of each other together, but with adding a little bit of something outside every so often. So every few generations, I'll get something a little different coming in, which keeps things healthy and diverse, but I'm still keeping that type that I'm trying to breed for. And I'm selecting for that. Amazing. Emma, I would like to thank you. I even didn't ask uh, you so many questions I wanted to ask because you're giving so full answers. So it's it's amazing how generously you are sharing your knowledge and your experience. And I think uh, after some time, we have to repeat this talk with you, with the new questions. and. Uh, Thank you for everything you are doing for this breed, for being yourself and for not losing the quality of the den. <laughs> well, sometimes, sometimes we all breed ones that don't make it into the showing and I'm no different. And look, I thank you for asking me and I, I hope it's been helpful to people listening. And I'm always available on Messenger. If anyone wants to ask me anything, I don't know everything. My ideas are just my ideas. I would never want someone to think that um, my way is the only way. But I think if we all share our knowledge, then we can pick and choose and grow as breeders For and sure. keep this breed alive. Thanks a lot. <laughs>